Displayed in the public rooms of the 2nd Battalion, the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment, is a painting that portrays the landing at Gold Beach on D-Day by the Hampshire Regiment. There is no film evidence of the Hampshire's fighting on D-Day, and their operational diary does not give an hourly account. This may be because their commanding officer was wounded and their second-in-command killed by a sniper's bullet early in the action. Generally, this omission from the records is regarded as an indication of the torrid time experienced by the men on D-Day. By 1944, the Hampshires were already a battle-seasoned unit, having played a similar role in the North African campaign as well as the assault on Sicily. These conflicts took a heavy toll on the regiment, and this may have influenced planners' choice in using them again to spearhead the D-Day landings, which were expected to inflict heavy losses on the assault troops. At the centre of the five designated landing areas for Allied troops on D-Day was Gold Beach to be taken by the 231st Brigade of the British 50th Infantry Division, which included the Hampshires. According to the intelligence diary for the 231st Brigade, the brigade commander visited Southampton docks before D-Day and spoke to the men on the infantry landing ships, HMS Glenroy, Empire Spearhead, Empire Crossbow, Empire Arquebus, to wish them Godspeed. Meanwhile, along the coastline of northern France, Allied minesweepers prepared safe channels for the Armada. During the final approach, the greatest threat came from the Americans, who managed to ease a number of points off their course and threatened to jockey the convoy out of their swept channel. But Commander Wheeler refused to be bounced, and after a brisk nautical exchange, the U.S. Navy ships were obliged to shear off. The ships were to reach their release position off the coast of France at about 5.25 a.m., and under the cover of the tail end of the naval and air bombardment, the assault landing craft were lowered into the water to get away from the LSIs and make for the shore. The 50th Northumbrian Division was to go in on the right of the 3rd of the three assault divisions of the 2nd Army, with 69 and 231st as the two assault brigades. At Jig, the first wave of infantry arrived at 725 and immediately came under fire from the fortified gun at Le Hamel that survived the bombing. The tanks that were supposed to arrive in advance of the infantry were delayed by rough seas and didn't arrive until 8. Many of the tanks got bogged down on the beach or were taken out by enemy fire. Two companies of the 1st Battalion Hampshire Regiment landed very close to the strong point at La Hamel and had to fight their way through enemy garrisons to get off the beach. Attempts to flank La Hamel were made difficult by the surrounding machine gun placements, mines, and barbed wire. They soon captured strong point WN-36, but had to break off the attack when they turned west and came under heavy fire from strong point WN-37. The only other way to capture that strong point was to circle around and attack the emplacement from the rear, a process that took several hours. So here at Jig was attacked by uh, the 1st Hampshires and the 1st Dorsetshire. Uh, the 1st Hampshires landed pretty close to this position and were immediately under fire from what you can see directly behind me. This is WN-37. This was the strongest fortification on Gold Beach that morning. Uh, there was a German 88 millimeter uh, anti-tank gun, or pretty much an all-purpose gun, that was here. Uh, and this area was ringed by machine guns and mortars. It's a very tough nut to crack. As you can see, there's bullet holes and there's chunks taken out of the concrete from uh, fire coming in. Uh, this put up a very stiff fight. So the first Hampshire's landed in this part of the beach at about 7.25 in the morning. And they uh, were able to take WN-36, which is a separate fortification. It's not visible today, but it's in that direction a little bit of a ways. And they started coming up this way to take out this bunker. Uh, and they were unable to do so because this bunker was laying down incredibly fierce fire. The nearby sanatorium complex was also providing a hotbed of resistance. There were a number of other concealed machine gun positions into brooks built into the sea wall. The first Hampshires were taking more and more casualties and clearly there were more Germans here than expected and of a very different fighting quality than some of the coastal units defending King Beach. Uh, men started to pile up on the beach and were unable to move inland because the village of Anel and Versumer, which is in that direction, were still heavily defended by the Germans and it took house-to-house -to -house combat to get the Germans out of this town. 
So in the meantime, there were men bunching up on this beach and the tide was coming in. So it became a problem of getting the men and the equipment off the beach in time. A plan was made in the early afternoon for B Company to give fire support to C Company as they established themselves within La Hamel East and bring them within 250 yards of the sanatorium position. C Company started its advance at 1345, but it took an hour of difficult fighting to attain dominance in the area. B Company now moved up to about 50 yards from the sanatorium in order to put in a final attack, but was held up by heavy fire. Luckily, at the same time, an AVRE from Assault Breaching Team 2 managed to find its way from the beach. When it fired a dustbin bomb at the sanatorium, a huge amount of smoke and dust erupted, but German fire was only temporarily disrupted. Five further bombs caused considerable damage, and the first Hampshires were able to get inside and mop up any remaining resistance. Sherwood Ranger Yeomanry tanks supported the AVRE. The AVR then moved to the rear of the large concrete position, WN37, that had caused so many problems on Jig Beach. One round into the back of the bunker finally brought to an end German resistance there. Over 30 prisoners were taken in these two actions, and La Hamel East was finally in the hands of the 1st Hampshires, but the protracted and deadly German resistance meant that it took till around 1700 hours. Part of the problem had been that, as well as the early bombing falling 3,000 yards away from the target, and strong point WN37 in particular being well protected from the naval gunfire on its seaward flank, the casualties amongst the 1st Hampshire's officers and the close nature of the fighting meant that radio contact with naval bombardment forces could not be effectively exploited. 1st Hampshire Sea Company was now able to advance more easily through La Hamel to take the 50mm gun position strong point WN38 at the west end of the village. So we're still here at Gold Beach. This right here is WN38. WN standing for Widerstand's Nest or Strong Point Resistance Nest. It's kind of a rough translation. I didn't mention that before. Uh, but about six or 700 uh, kilometers, or sorry, uh, yards or meters that way. Uh, is WN37, which was the strongest fortification on Gold Beach that morning, June 6, 1944, D-Day. Um, actually, it was the first Hampshires that did take this bunker as well. So they uh, were able to take WN37, which is in that direction, at about 4 p.m., and then went on with the help of an AVRE tank to take this. Uh, the D Company of the Hampshires went in that direction to take WN39. Even so, the Germans in the area fought back and Sergeant Scaife's AVRE was put to further use, bombarding fortified houses, and a further 20 prisoners were taken. D Company of the 1st Hampshires had advanced around Le Hamel and moved to attack the strong point WM39, described as a half-troop position in reports. This comprised a 75mm gun and an 88mm gun in separate concrete bunkers wired in with minefields fronting them. Both guns were sighted in front of Le Hamel and could also engage craft to the east of the position up to 3,000 yards away. Gunboat Flores had engaged the battery at 0630 and it was engaged again by the destroyers HMS Undine, HMS Cottesmore and HMS Catastop at various times during the morning when the position was observed firing on the beaches. The guns at WN39 were two of the most effective on D-Day, firing between them over 150 rounds. Investigation after D-Day showed that again the early bombing had missed. D Company was able to capture both WN-39 and continue to take the radar station on top of the cliffs relatively easily. However, the war diary reports enemy 88mm guns and Spandau teams put up a determined resistance. At any rate, after La Hamel seemed under control, B and C companies joined D Company at the radar station and the move into Aramanche itself was organised. Some of the battalion support company Bren carriers had arrived and several AVREs seemed available. D Company had taken about 40 prisoners, some coming up from Aramanche under a white flag. In the days after D-Day, it was essential for the Allies to get supplies on the beach. We didn't necessarily have a good deep water port. That was uh, the objective of the Americans over in the west, taking the Cherbourg Peninsula. So in the meantime, the Allies 
took some barges, sunk them, lined them up along here and made an artificial harbor and the remains of which is still visible to this day. A bombardment on the battery beyond Aramanche by naval vessels and a 147 field regiment was arranged and D Company advanced to the south and rear of the town to take this objective. Major Mott then descended into Aramanche with C Company and he reports little opposition and that Aramanche was full of French people. Flowers came out and tree colours and Union Jacks. I had been told that all coastal inhabitants had been moved inland but these were delighted to see us. The right flank of the Gold Beach Landing was now securely held. Brigadier Stan here came up and congratulated the men for a magnificent show. The 1st Hampshire suffered 182 casualties in the single day, but remained operational. By the evening of June 6, the bridgehead at Gold was the strongest of the five, despite the remaining German resistance pockets throughout the beachhead area. 24,970 troops had landed, along with 2,100 vehicles. The 50th Division had lost around 700 men. Total casualties from all units involved in operations at Gold were around 1,000 men, of which 350 were killed. German losses are unknown. At least 1,000 were taken prisoner. There was a feeling on D-Day that because of the casualties and the length of time to achieve their objectives, the Hampshire Regiment would be criticised. In reality, they showed tremendous courage and discipline in the face of difficult circumstances. According to the regimental history for D-Day, every Hampshire man knew the importance of the task that was given to the battalion and never hesitated. They understood the honour as a spearhead of the attack and the first British troops ashore and rose to the challenge.